evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting uh, tonight, August 12th. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is a public meeting for us to discuss and receive comments on the application for a comprehensive permit site approval letter from Mass Housing by NBM Realty LLC, also referred to as Arlington Land Realty. So the purpose of this meeting tonight of the Board of Selectmen is for us to have the opportunity to ask questions and receive comments so that we can uh, put vote on Monday evening, August 17th, the Board of Selectmen's next meeting, to vote on a letter making comments to Mass Housing uh, related to this matter. Up front, beside me, we have the vice, my name is Kevin Greeley, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Next to me, I have Diane Mahan, who is the Vice Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Stephen Byrne, Mr. Dan Dunn, Mr. Joe Curo. I'm going to ask Arlington Land Realty to, to introduce themselves in a moment. To my left, we have our Deputy Town Manager, uh, Adam Chapdelaine, has 102 fever and is just sick that he can't be here with us this evening. <laughs> But so we have our deputy town manager, Andrew Flanagan. Next to our, uh, Andrew, we have our special uh, municipal council, Mr. John Whitten. Next to John, we have our town council, who is, um, what's your name again, young man? <laughs> He's a Yankees fan, Doug, Doug Hine, but we still love him. He's a hell of a council. Uh, next, we have our director of planning and development, Carol Kowalski. And then next to Carol, we also have Corey Beckwith, who is um, a, um, a conservation administrator. So the way the meeting's going to run is first, we have asked uh, uh, Arlington Land Realty, if they would please, to uh, uh, make a presentation to us. That will be followed by questions, comments from each of the members of the Board of Selectmen. And then the Board of Selectmen, of course, would like to hear your comments. And when we get to that part, we're going to ask each person to limit themselves to two minutes. Uh, look around the room, you see how many people are here, and we're sure many of them would like to be heard on this matter. Uh, th this was not necessary for them to come here and do this with us this evening, so we appreciate that. But uh, friends, this is a Board of Selectmen meeting. We listen to one another. So we don't really want booing, clapping, or any of that. We will all listen to anybody who speaks and ask you please to keep decorum throughout this meeting. So, uh, with that said, let me uh, now turn it over uh, to Arlington Land Realty. You've come out. Um, our, my name is Gwen Noyes. I'm a partner of Oak Tree Development, and uh, we're working, as you know, with the Mugar family on, on this project that we're here to talk about tonight. Um, with me this evening is Bob Angler from SEB, and my partner Arthur Klipfell from, from Oak Tree, and Mark Beaudry, who is with Meridian Engineering, and Chrissa Gibson who is also from Oak Tree. Um, so uh, if it's OK, I'll just stand on the, right here as we, uh, yes, OK. And Bob is going to start off. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Engler. I just wanted to have a few preliminary uh, process uh, comments before we get into what we're uh, showing tonight. Just, and, and this is a repeat to some of you who are at the site walk with mass housing but I think it bears repeating what we're actually, from our point of view, going through at this point in time. Uh, the first step was our site approval application in May to Mass Housing. Mass Housing, as the quasi-public entity that reviews these things, is kind of the gatekeeper for this process. But they're taking a very broad brush look at the site, at our design, at our numbers, to see whether it's within the market of feasibility, whether the costs and the revenues are okay, more or less, whether the design is acceptable to them, and whether the, the development team has the capacity to do this kind of development. So they're looking at very general things. Uh, as, as they said at that meeting, or that site walk, the very specific things that mostly you're concerned about, traffic, hydrology, how the site works, et cetera, 
is appropriately dealt with if we get a site approval letter at the local level at the zoning board when consultants and peer review uh, consultants can be hired and can interchange with our experts and that can go on for several months. So that's when a lot of this information will be forthcoming. We don't have those answers at that stage because we're at the first stage, which is if we don't get a site letter, we don't have a project. So one step at a time, we recognize that what we've turned in is preliminary. We recognize we can't answer all the questions and concerns that are here. We hope to do that if we get to the next level and really have more information to share at that point in time. So we are here for a third time of talking to either neighbors or town officials or the selectmen. We don't want to go back through the whole thing. We're going to do a refresher uh, with a PowerPoint presentation so we have a baseline of what people are looking at. And then we hope, after a brief presentation, to uh, answer questions or at least listen to them at this point. So I'll turn that over to Gwen and we'll start the actual development discussion itself. Thank you. As Bob said, um, this is a repeat for uh, a number of you. I I'm just curious how many of you were at the May 21st meeting uh, at the Hardy School? <laughs> Quite a lot of you. So, so you're just going to have to bear with seeing uh, uh, much of the same material. And as he also said, uh, in the time between now and, and that time, we have not been delving into the, the, uh, the considerations that we know we will be um, because it isn't yet time. This is, would be the preparation for the ZBA and the Conservation Commission meetings are when we would be doing that. We have, however, brought on board um, our, our uh, new uh, civil engineer. Uh, some of you s saw uh, Dave Albrecht from Sol uh, Borrego Solar. He's unable to continue because it's uh, not the kind of firm that, that has the sort of expertise that Meridian and Mark bring. Um, so I'm going to, I uh, don't know how to advance the, the, the slides. Um, so this is going to be a shorter version of what many of you have already seen. Um, first, this is uh, an existing conditions slide that Mark is going to go back to, uh, but I just wanted to show you that the, the shaded area is what is above the FEMA line, which everybody is concerned about. It is so-called buildable. It's above the FEMA, the, the uh, state, uh, the regulated FEMA line. Um, this is the site plan you've seen before, and the couple of things that are are relevant here that uh, the, the wetlands that has been delineated is here and, and the, the plan that we're showing is, is bringing about 10 acres of, of land uh, into conservation uh, use as well as providing connectivity. This is where the little bridge goes over Route 2 and this would be a path that goes out to the bicycle path, the uh, Minuteman bikeway. Um, and so this is, this is generally what we're, we're talking about uh, so, uh, proposing to the town. These are townhouses, and this would be a, a four-story building above parking. One of the things that has been uh, talked about is how much parking we would need, and that's something we can, we can uh, have some discussion with the ZBA. Right now, the parking takes up quite a lot of, of, of uh, paved area outside, but most of it is under the buildings. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but the uh, pavement area, obviously, uh, is not as permeable as, as we would like, and if we can reduce the amount of parking that's required, that would be advisable. The townhouses are, uh, I'll show you those in, in just a second, but um, there are two, home, two townhouses per uh, building as shown there. This is, this is to show a section through the property, just get the scale. This is existing homes. This would be the proposed townhouses. This is the buffer between the, the 
new townhouses and the existing building, and that's the scale of it. And of course, the, the open land continues over and off the drawing uh, over to Route 2. Uh, this is just showing the you know, preliminary design idea for townhouses. They would be uh, appropriate for families. This shows how the, um, the parking would be underneath the building, the majority of the parking, which is, of course, uh, a, a key attraction for, for one of the major demographics that we would see to be living in the building, uh, people, older people who, for whom uh, shoveling snow is not what they're interested in doing, and uh, so it, it, it makes it very convenient for them. Um, this is this is a vision that that I think is uh, it's a picture I took of of the wetlands that are uh, just across Route Two. And I think um, it, th being able to walk th around the wetlands that has uh, uh, been open to view and and uh, can be a good home for wildlife. It would be something an asset that that uh, would make it genuinely um, uh, uh, accessible for. The, the people in the neighborhood and the whole town. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to, to Mark, and uh, he's going to talk about how this could be achieved, maybe. Thanks, Gwen. Uh, as Gwen mentioned, my name is Mark Beaudry. I'm a professional engineer with Meridian Associates uh, here in Massachusetts. We have offices in Beverly and uh, Westboro, Massachusetts. I happen to be in the Westboro office. and. Uh, Meridian's been doing this kind of work, you know, for over 25 years at this point, and um, we uh, are, you know, happy to be uh, involved in this project now, and um, we actually just recently got on board, so we have not done any extensive studies at this, at this time, so what we're going to do is, what I'd like to do is just kind of speak to go over quickly um, some of the existing site conditions and talk a little bit about the engineering process, um, you know, kind of moving forward. So I'm, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the property um, that is this uh, shaped piece of property right here uh, with Dorothy being uh, up, up at this location, Little John and um, Birch over in this uh, area. So the, the property has, uh, um, it's 17.7 .7 acres total uh, area uh, with, uh, e uh, this is Route 2 along the, um, uh, you know, the s southern and southwestern side of the site with the uh, Vox apartments uh, across the street in this area right here. Um, the, out of the, uh, uh, clearly the site has um, some, uh, some constraints on it that we're all familiar with. Uh, that include wetlands, as shown right here. We see some uh, bordering vegetated wetlands here. There are some wetlands down on this side and a little bit along this edge right here and some over in the corner here on the, on the state property. Um, associated with those wetlands are 100-foot buffer zones around the, uh, around the wetland areas that bring these uh, wetland areas into uh, the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission um, as well as the Zoning Board. So at the appropriate time, this project will, um, you know, if, if approved by, by the Zoning Board, would go before the Conservation Commission for review as well. And uh, a, another uh, constraint on this site is the 100-year uh, the FEMA floodplain. Now, the FEMA study from 2010 had uh, established an elevation of 7.6 on, uh, on, on this property in the area. So what we did was mapped out that red line right there, as you can see, in that location, this location, over in this area, over on this edge over here. Uh, that red line on that graphic represents the 100-year floodplain elevation of 7.6. So what we then did was shade the area above the 100-year floodplain on the site, which is that area right there and some other smaller isolated areas. Um, out of the 17.7 .7 acres of total property area, um, the area above the 100-year floodplain is, uh, is six acres, roughly. And 
if you recall the, uh, the, the site development slide, um, the, a driveway comes in off of Little John, another driveway comes in at this location with the townhomes along Dorothy and the, L, the, the other buildings in this area right here. So the buildings, uh, you know, pavement, et cetera, are located substantially within that uh, gray shaded area. Now, as part of the uh, various state regulations and whatnot that affect this project, um, one is uh, having to deal with what's called bordering land subject to flooding, which is basically all the land area that's below the 100-year floodplain line. So what the state regulations require, as well as local bylaws, is that um, the, uh, any filling of that wetland area be compensated for at every incremental elevation um, at, with at least a volume equal to that which is filled. So any floodplain volume that is, is displaced or filled has to be replaced, something in excess, actually, of the, of the amount that is, uh, that is actually filled. The, another thing that is uh, another uh, uh, significant regulation here that applies is the DEPs, uh, the State Stormwater Management Regulations. Those come into play because of uh, the project is going to be subject to conservation review. Now, there are 10 standards in the stormwater regulations that have to be uh, met. And kind of boiling those down in a nutshell is uh, you have to manage peak flow rates uh, on the property so that when you develop the project site, you cannot exceed flow rates um, that come, are coming off the property under existing conditions. So you basically have to mitigate your runoff from the project to existing levels. Another issue that has to be dealt with under the regulations is water quality. So that, um, you know, we all know that stormwater can have some nasty stuff in it at times, and uh, that's pretty well documented. And so the, the state requires that the uh, stormwater runoff actually be treated before it's discharged. So uh, that is a, an important element of the stormwater regulations as well. And um, the, uh, uh, the final thing would be uh, that you have to mimic existing conditions from a recharge standpoint. So a site that's recharging um, stormwater, uh, uh, you know, under uh, natural conditions has to also recharge stormwater under proposed conditions. So you, you th those three key elements are coming into play and will be the subject of very close design and a lot of, uh, you know, scrutiny on, from an engineering standpoint as this project moves forward. We, uh, it, and, and then again, the compensatory storage, um, you know, floodplain requirements as well will be obviously looked at very closely also. What we anticipate with this process is that um, although under Chapter 40B, the comprehensive permit requirements, really only requires preliminary plans. But in this case where um, there are not only these constraints, but you know, conservation uh, reviews that are pending and whatnot, what we typically do is bring the design to a higher level than just preliminary design to be able to demonstrate to, to, the, to the municipalities and whatnot and, uh, that, that we are meeting the requirements of the regulations uh, to ensure that a, a project is being proposed that addresses the concerns of the, uh, of the community, frankly. And I, I don't think anybody w here wants to, uh, you know, have a project that's going to have, uh, you know, any environmental impact. So um, that will certainly be a, a mission of ours is to design a project that, that complies with the, with the state regulations. Um, and, and, yeah, and... Thank you, Gwen. And, and actually, uh, you know, if possible, we, we'd like to improve existing conditions. Um, as I'm sure a lot of people are aware, there's a lot of uh, fill material on the site right now that's not the best quality fill. I, I think there's going to there's a lot of invasive species on the sites right now. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done from a site standpoint to uh, um, it, it to to improve the site conditions, maybe from an environmental standpoint, ideally, and provide better access for the neighborhood to the footbridge over to the T station and, and whatnot. So um, that's it.
Yes, I'd, I'd like to make one more little wrap-up statement, and that is that after all, this is about housing. Um, we understand that hydrology is an incredibly important piece of what we're looking at, but, but um, housing is what we're he here to uh, make these improvements that, that Mark has been talking about. And one, one uh, aspect of this that, that uh, people may not appreciate is that when you build housing that has 25% of it earmarked to be affordable, 100% of the whatever is built goes toward the count for Arlington's uh, affordable uh, requirement. As you, I'm sure, know, 10% of the housing stock in Arlington is the goal, and right now there's a deficit of 4.4%, something like that. So there's, there's 5.6 is here, and there's a another another chunk of housing that's needed. So uh, maybe some of you are aware that at one point part of the site was being, was being uh, considered for housing some years ago um, uh, if the state had provided some funding uh, for the town to do so there would have been housing there today but that that source of funding didn't come through and so this is another another alternative. Um, I think that's all we need, we have to say right now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Now I'm going to turn it over to individual members of the Board of Selectmen for their questions and or comments, and I'm going to start with Mr. Dan Dunn. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I took my jacket off, and that is not a sign of disrespect. It's just a sign that it's middle of August. Um, I'm definitely very concerned about the wetlands, and so those, some of those comments were very well taken, but I think most of my questions are about the wetlands. Uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback that there, about, and, and I know myself about some of the history of flooding in that neighborhood, uh, both in the neighborhood and downstream. And I'm curious, how much are you aware of the scope and frequency of the flooding that happens in the neighborhood? And say I've taken a bunch of pictures uh, after major storms. Which years? Oh, uh, I, I can't tell you. I can't remember. But it was a couple of years ago. I came out after after a, a, a major flooding in the area, and uh, I watched the, the basements being pumped out into the street. And uh, so that's that is some experience. Uh, yeah, we we're certainly aware of the uh, of the flooding concerns. Um, saw the Facebook, you know, page, you know, in, in the various pictures on that site. Um, the, uh, I, I don't think anybody's denying that there's a, there's a floodplain issue here and that needs to be carefully looked at and, you know, uh, and designed to ensure that we're not, that, that the project is not going to, uh, you know, compound that, that problem. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. I'm also concerned that uh, there isn't enough appreciation of the long history and not just the adjacent spaces, but also downstream in the Sunnyside, Sunnyside neighborhood and all along the Alewife Brook. And, uh, you know, going out for a couple storms or pictures from Facebook, this has been flooding for a lot longer than that. And it's been wetlands for a lot longer than any of us have been here. And, I, um, and I'm definitely concerned that that isn't reflected anywhere in uh, the, the proposal that you've made. And I think that that's something that bears uh, a lot further um, inspection. You mentioned the paving and the amount of paving that's there. Uh, paving, as you mentioned and as we all know, is impervious and creates a lot more of a flooding, in particular during peak events. What uh, do you plan on, what, what's, how do you plan on ma uh, managing that? There's several techniques. Uh, the uh, it, it basically to meet peak flow management, uh, you know, you, you we're looking for at on-site detention, and those on-site uh, stormwater management areas would be separate from the from the compensatory flood storage areas. So we're not double dipping with those things. So um, the uh, you know the, there there are underground you know storage techniques that can be done. There are uh, some you know some some low impact development techniques that can be can be uh, in, implemented into the uh, 
into the design, such as uh, bioretention basins, tree filters, you know, things like that. Um, we're going to be looking at the a various array of, of uh, tools to, uh, to make sure that we're meeting the regulations. Have, are any of those indicated on the plans we've gotten so far? Uh, I think there was, we, we did not prepare the, the, the site plan, but uh, I believe that there was some things shown on the original site plan and some of those, tech, some of those ideas. I read it pretty close, and I, definitely some of the notation is opaque to me, but I wasn't able to understand any of it. Uh, I wasn't able to see to that. I believe that there was some uh, pervious pavement area shown, yep. uh, which is certainly something that could be, could be done here. I believe that was a, an imper uh, pervious pavement area. I believe there was one over here from, and there was a, uh, uh, a, a basin shown in the middle of that roundabout area. There were these, you know, there's some tree box filter ideas shown. Um, but these are not cast in stone, certainly, yeah. at, at this point. It, they're preliminary ideas and just kind of representing kind of a palette of what could be done. Thank you. Uh, do you, do your understanding, uh, would we, would this project have drainage into adjacent street drainage systems? Uh, currently, the site drains towards, uh, substantially towards our Route 2. There are three culverts that uh, I, I've seen on existing conditions plans. Uh, w one of the culverts, the previous engineer was not able to find down in this area. There's a couple, that's an 18, I recall. I think there's two 24-inch culverts. Um, they do, one is quite flat that I could see from the existing conditions plan, but they do tend to drain to the south side of Route 2. Um, so we would anticipate that the, that the site is going to drain down to, uh, you know, to the conservation area, this, uh, this, this uh, open space area, and find its way towards Route 2 like it does now. Now, something that's important to point out is that these culverts are not in great condition under Route 2. Uh, they, they could use some cleaning. Uh, from what I understand, one of them at this location is, I've heard anywhere from a half to two-thirds of its uh, diameter is full of sediment. Could certainly, uh, you know, get some, uh, you know, work work with the town to, you know, work with the state to get some of that stuff cleaned out, which is certainly going to help the situation out here. Existing conditions as well as proposed. So, do you propose that it's going to drain away from Route Two or towards Arlington Two or both? We're anticipating that it's going to drain towards Route Two, not towards the neighborhood. Thank you. You're welcome. So one of the things uh, that you've, that I think I've heard a couple different times is that the plans that we've been presented aren't complete enough for us to evaluate whether or not they're going to be able to manage the flooding. Uh, in fact, we, in our, our expert told us that they don't think that, you, that it, is, it can be done. And so we've got a consultant report that says that it can't. And we've got, uh, and we don't have anything from your group that would explain to us how we can trust that the flooding is going to be managed. Can you help us uh, explain how we would react to that? Like, I mean, how how are we? How do you expect? How can we make a smart recommendation about this without sufficient information? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. That's a dilemma that comes up all the time. Uh, the way 40B is structured. It's not only a dilemma for you to, to comment when you don't have enough information, but sometimes even the peer review consultants in front of the ZBA are asking for more information, uh, even though it's only preliminarily submitted. Uh, we're gonna, we can't answer that for you tonight, so you can raise those questions. We intend to and endeavor to answer them in front of the zoning board to the satisfaction of either the zoning board or and or state DEP so that the, we can receive a permit. If we can't, we don't have a project. So uh, the burden is on us to get that done. We just aren't doing it right today, but it will be done. There's a, probably a 90-day period, 60 to 90 days, if we get a site letter, when all this testing can be done and research can be done. When we get to the zoning board and you hire, or the zoning board hires consultants, this will be vetted very carefully, and that's when it'll happen. So I appreciate that you're in a dilemma now, but you can raise the information. We just can't answer it right now. All right. So when, when you don't have insuff insufficient information, you work with what you've got. And so I'm going to work with the presentation, with the, the a proposal that uh, you 
gave to us and some of the presentation you gave tonight. A lot of the proposal uh, talks about a single wetland, but I also heard tonight a discussion of multiple wetlands, and the previous site study said that there's multiple wetlands. Is there controversy about how many wetlands there are? I think some of the confusion, we're not the wetland consultant, just so you know, but some of the confusion might be that there are bordering vegetated wetlands as well as isolated wetlands on the property. So the isolated wetlands would come into play under local bylaws where the bordering vegetated wetlands that actually have to border on something, you know, like a, a, uh, some kind of water body, a drainage channel or something like that versus an isolated pocket. Um, those BVWs, as they're called, are subject to review under the State Wetlands Protection Act. So there might be a little confusion when you're talking about bordering versus isolated. Yeah. I don't think I'm the one confused in this case. I'm reading, <laughs> this one's me reading the application. That okay. it, 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 it's definitely, it does not consistently refer to multiple wetlands, and it specifically talks about a single, which I found concerning. Uh, are you aware that the, this FEMA map the one that you were showing up earlier that has the floodplain, um, that actually appears to be on the 1982 FEMA floodplain, not the 2010. Okay. Okay. Please. Well, I've got a copy of in my my bag actually of the latest FEMA mapping, mm -hmm. and you know it 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 shows the. Uh, and now, there's a datum difference here. When you, when you do the correction on the datum, you, you arrive at the 7.6 elevation. And I think the previous engineer went into detail on that at the, uh, at the, inf the informational meeting back in May. But so I guess when you, when you read the FEMA map the way I, I read the FEMA map, most of the buildings that are proposed are in the 100-year floodplain. I, th I think some of the confusion there is because when the FEMA mapping was done, they specify an elevation, but they don't, they don't um, have detailed on the ground topo like had been done on this project site. So when you take that elevation and apply that elevation to the topography on the site, you arrive at the line that we have in that graphic, as opposed to a generalized area that might have been based on USGS topo or something like that to uh, determine the, the extent of that floodplain. It so you're, so you're saying up a lot. So you're saying that the proposal that you've got in yours, in the, pro the proposal that we read, you believe is on the 2010 map? Correct. Okay. Um, and, is it cor and is it correct that one of the waivers you're seeking is of the Arlington Wetlands bylaws, is that correct? Including the compensatory storage requirements? Can I answer that? Um, they, as you have heard, yeah. I think if you yes. point them out, okay. like, the, like, yeah, that'll like, like do that better way. for you. Okay. Um, the, the, I, I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm going to repeat the question. My question was, uh, is it correct that they, that you are seeking a waiver of the Arlington wetlands bylaw, in particular, the part, the parts about compensatory storage? Um, as you know. Mark Beaudry is, is new to the civil engineering assignment uh, that we're, we're providing. Um, David Albrecht, who was with Borrego Solar and had worked on this property for a long, many years, um, d uh, uh, informed us that the design criteria that he was working with was that it would adhere to the Arlington two for one, but he felt like it, because the this, this state requirement is one for one, that he would check off the waiver uh, request so that there would be some room for error, should there be any. Uh, it would give him some flexibility. But he says that as the plans are drawn, it does adhere to Arlington's two for one requirement. I guess what I'm hoping then is that the next sentence is so that we're not going to apply for a waiver to that. You know, I, I, we haven't. It, this is, this is uh, something that we, we are. We see that this is a, a process of working with the town and the design and so on and so forth. We're not. We're nowhere near complete with how that all sorts out. It's our intention to, to, to work very closely with with Arlington's 
uh, request for two for one, but I, I don't want to promise that. Thank you. I guess, so the line of questions that I've given here is, is something uh, that there's some vague claims in the proposal that it's going to, that this pro, pro, uh, building can make the situation at this wetlands, or in this position, in this property, in specific, the wetlands better. But there's no technical, scientific, or engineering work that backs up that claim. And in fact, the supporting documents are inconsistent in terms of the number of wetlands that are being described. And I find the I am utterly unconvinced that the map of the FEMA uh, line is correct at this point. In, the, in the, that, furthermore, saying that believing that you can, or saying that you're going to make the site better, and simultaneously saying I don't want to follow the Arlington Wetlands bylaws is absolutely inconsistent. Um, is there? Uh, I, I guess uh, th that's uh, if you have any thoughts as to why we would entertain or why we would be interested in supporting a waiver like that in such an absence of new and interesting and productive information, I'm interested. Uh, let me try and answer that. <clears throat> the waiver request at the site approval process with Mass... Yeah. The waiver request at site approval is very general based on very general preliminary plans. You have to do it because it's a requirement. You're not held to that. You're asking a question that we can answer when we file with the zoning board, if we get that far, and after the detailed engineering is done, and we see that we can live with two for one, or we can't, or it's one and a half for one, or whatever. At that point, when we file, we're going to know what we can live with. So we can't answer that we're, we need a waiver, we don't need a waiver, because we don't have enough information ourselves to be able to answer that question. But most developers protect themselves by saying, well, we better put that in. We don't know that until we actually get in front of the zoning board. But you're also protecting yourself on one hand, but on the other hand, you're saying, don't worry, it can be better when we're done with it. Here's what we're saying. Our intent is to make it better, and if we can't make it better, and we don't follow the state regulations, we don't have a project and we can be denied. That's our burden. So we're going to be able, you know, forget the fact that we're, we're saying it'll be better. We have to demonstrate it, as you've indicated, and that's our burden to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, you can applaud for us. That's right. No. Uh, but our special counsel is asked to make a comment at this point, so I'm going to allow that, and then we'll go to the next selectman. John Whitten. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I just want to comment on Mr. Engler's earlier comment and his later comment, which is these are preliminary plans and the board will get the detail that you seek at the ZBA level. Mr. Engler knows better than anybody that once the project eligibility letter is issued by Mass Housing, which is why we're here tonight, then the burden is going to be on the town of Arlington to demonstrate why this project doesn't fit within the town, and that is a very difficult burden. The town could be protected in many ways, including the 1.5% calculation, but it is disingenuous and totally unacceptable for an applicant to come here with preliminary plans that are as gross a preliminary set of plans as I've ever seen and say, don't worry, we'll deal with the details at the Board of Appeals level. Because at that level, the burden has shifted to the town of Arlington. The burden right now is on the applicant to convince the Board of Selectmen why they should support this project to mass housing. And based on the presentation that we've seen tonight, and the answers to the prior questioners' questions. It's impossible to discern any depth of this project, and it's not acceptable for an applicant to tell the Board of Selectmen, don't worry, the details will be worked out with the Board of Appeals. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, I'm going to allow it each time I come up here, but otherwise, no. All right, Mr. Joe Curo, next on the Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No pun intended. I think the council is saying that the application doesn't hold water. <laughs> <laughs> is that allowed, Mr. Chair? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
But I'm not going to talk about water primarily. I, I think that my colleague, Mr. Dunn, asked a lot of questions along those lines. Um, I want to say that in my time on the board, there's, there's probably, and probably on all of our times on the board, there's probably nothing that's occupied um, our time and energy as much as issues of uh, traffic and parking. And there's perhaps no neighborhood that we've heard from and, and tried to work with more than the neighborhood directly abutting um, the, the proposed uh, development. Um, now, the development is, is billed as a transit-oriented development. I get that it's close to uh, Ill Life Station, but that really only serves a portion of your likely residents. Um, I don't know if the applicants have read Arlington's master plan. Uh, we had in there some uh, documentation of the uh, you know, numbers of Arlington residents who work in communities that are not readily accessible from your site by the MBTA, and there are a lot. I count myself am among those. Many who work out of 128, for example. Also, the master plan documents that, that um, <clears throat> only 16.7% of our residents currently use public transportation to get to work. We wish it was more, but at this point in time, it's, it is not. So I'm guessing that the applicants recognize this because the, the application includes 304 parking spots. That's 304 more autos going through that, that um, really problematic neighborhood, uh, tra you know, traffic challenge neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> without major changes to your plan, it seems to me that most of your residents are going to drive, and the impact's going to be felt on Dorothy Road and the surrounding uh, neighborhood. And this is in your plan, despite you know, previous assurances by Mugars on previous proposals that there would be um, no access to this neighborhood. Previous projects were given special permit approval, contingent upon no access to this neighborhood, but now we're forced to consider a uh, project that would run those 304 uh, vehicles through, through this, uh, this neighborhood. A, a neighborhood which I might note is, is abutted by a, a, a heavily used playing field and a, and a, uh, and a school and, and uh, you know, used uh, as a lot of children in, in the area. So, during, Ms. Noyes, during your presentation, you, you talked about the, the number of parking spots, and um, you said that you hoped that, when, that if and when you get to the ZBA that you'll be able to um, push for fewer uh, parking spots. And I, I want to just challenge the developers that if, if you really are intent on going forward with this um, proposal, that you really put your money where your mouth is on, on making it a transit-oriented development and really force, um, force the issue and propose a drastic reduction of the number of parking spots for the, um, for the proposal. Um, this would be actually consistent with our master plan pr principle of looking at reduced parking ratios. We haven't adopted those yet, but I would encourage you um, to, to, uh, to, to do this. The metropolitan area planning, uh, th this would do a couple of things. I mean, first of all, it would relieve traffic pressure in the neighborhoods. It would remove some of the impervious surfaces that are, that, that are certainly going to contribute to the uh, wetlands uh, issues within the neighborhood. And also it takes cost out, and uh, your, one of your stated goals is affordability of this project. And according to uh, data I was able to find from the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, surface spaces run something like $1,500 to $2,000 to build. Underground spots could be something like $20,000 to build. If we do the math on, on the number of parking spots that are, that are uh, proposed uh, for this site, um, it starts to quickly add up. And so I just wonder if you would... Um, comment on this issue, and uh, if you truly are looking to reduce the number of parking spots that, that you're, you're aiming for, I wonder if you could give us an idea of the scale of reduction that you're, you're looking for. Mr. Chairman, I've already been criticized for promising things, or the team has been promising things, and Mr. Witness pointed that out, so I'm not going to say don't worry, I'm going to say worry. Yeah. We've got to get to that. We can't commit to anything. We're going to look seriously at transit-oriented developments and what the parking requirements are. We're at 1.25 taking out the townhouses, which have two spaces per townhouse, which is fine. 
that's a, in my experience, having done many of these, that's a pretty low ratio for even transit oriented. So we're gonna take a look and see what's across the street and what's working. Uh, in past 10 years, the parking ratios have come way down in all these multifamily developments. So where it used to be 1.89 with a standard Avalon Bay kind of thing, come down to 1.7, 1.6, 1.5, 1.4, 1.3, we're at 125, we'll see, but it won't be massive, I can't say that. Gwen might say that, we need to talk about it, it's really an issue of research, so I'm not gonna put anything out there that we can't live with, so we'll deal with it when we get to the zoning board. Okay, so it sounds like as we stand now at 304. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Th thank you. Um, you know, our master plan also specifically uh, calls out the Mugar property as a priority for uh, presentation and town meeting has endorsed this concept at least three different occasions, as has the state. And uh, the town has exhibited a willingness to talk. And um, there have been many overtures uh, to, to discuss the potential acquisition of the property. Um, most recent that I'm aware of was last year. And um, in fact, I know that five years ago, there was a written agreement that was ready for signature and it was walked away from. I, I'm just curious, I mean, the, our town now has um, new tools like the Community Preservation Act. You know, we have uh, partners who can help us in this process, like the Arlington Land Trust has a lot of experience in this and has helped us in other areas. I mean, why would you not consider another round of discussions rather than, than um, you know, bringing forward such a controversial proposal that, that you know, clearly does not have the um, support of the community? I don't know what those discussions would entail. I can't speak for the Mugars. I wasn't on the team then, and they yeah. didn't come to the table with you. So that's a different issue. As for the master plan, I've read the master plan. Uh, I don't see anything specific in it about how to develop more affordable housing and where it's going like a planned production plan would do. If that's a plan that has specificity is where you're gonna do it, that's a plan that has to be respected. But your master plan talks about open space, but I didn't see anything that really said, here's where we're doing our affordable housing in significant numbers to get above 5.6%. So I don't doubt that you will tout what you've done, and I've seen what you've done. We've run the lottery for the affordable units in Brigham Square and some of your other developments. We know that. If those were 25% affordable, you might be over the 10% by now, but they weren't. So that's. A, water over the dam, the issue is going forward, how do we get more affordable housing? And if there's more discussion about how to make this site work that's still financially feasible, I'll be right in the middle of that. I don't know what the numbers look like in terms of what you might propose, but we're not closed off by any discussion by any means. Thank you. Um, you know, lastly, to the issue of affordability, um, I did want to just note that when I looked through the, the comparables that are included in the um, application, most of the units in, in, in this development, I mean, I'd be hard pressed to get a studio for where I pay for my, you know, mortgage and taxes on, on a, uh, a two bedroom uh, single family home, but that, that's neither here nor there. Um, and as far as the 10% the threshold, I appreciate the presentation that this would count towards our 10%, but I wanna just emphasize that the reason we're concerned about making that 10% threshold, one reason that we're concerned about that is to prevent just the scenario that we're, we're um, facing right now. Um, uh, so I, I'll just wrap up by, by saying that, you know, the Board of Selectmen is a, is a policy board, and I, for one, and, and I, I think my colleagues, but they'll speak for themselves, take very seriously the, the positions of town meeting and the policy statements that have been taken. And this town meeting has voted three times now um, a principle that, that supports the conservation of, of, of this land. And um, I have to say that on balance, uh, given the, um, some of the vagueness of the, of the application before us, the inability to give us more specifics, and the policy precedents that have already been set in the town, that, that um, I, I'm not feeling good about the proposal as it stands before us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, may I make one more response to that? Uh, sorry? Can I make one more response yes, to the sir. comments? This will be very unpopular, but that's okay. Uh, the master plan and the demographics for what Arlington's housing need is only one piece of the 40B equation of affordability, which most towns 
ignore, and that is the regional need for housing in the Boston metropolitan area is huge. All the articles in the paper for the last several years have talked about that. Every town has a responsibility for the last 44 years since this bill was passed, not just to deal with their own population, but to deal with the regional need. So whether you have people that are going to work here or there in Arlington, that's one piece of information. What about the people who would like to be in Arlington? They can't be in here on the affordable side. So we're dealing with a regional issue not just a local issue, and I want to make that clear that that's part of what the affordability requirements are under the statute. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call on Carol Kowalski, our Director of Planning and Development, and who headed up our master plan project. Carol. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. I think it's important to mention that the Town of Arlington has a housing plan, and the master plan recommends updating that to create a plan production plan, which we have undertaken. The Redevelopment Board uh, composed a committee this week who will advise on that, and Department of Housing and Community Development has given a grant to the town to help us accomplish that. In addition, I, I think it's important to mention that Arlington embraces density, which is something that Mr. Engler um, uh, endorses and in order to welcome more people to Arlington. We've always been a dense community, and we have even recently uh, welcomed additional people by uh, building the former Sims Hospital site, which has affordable housing in it, and that's a multi-family development, as you all know. And the Brigham's as well, the um, Alta Brigham's, that's a multi-family, that's a very new development. So I think Arlington has uh, done a very good job of welcoming new people into Arlington, creating affordable opportunities very recently at, at a higher density than a lot of municipalities would allow. Thank you. Uh, next, Mr. Stephen Byrne from the Board of Selectmen. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. And I'll realize that I did not get the applause that you get every time you come up here. <laughs> duly noted. Um, thank you. So, um, realize after coming a bit late in the speaker's lineup, a, a few of my questions have already been asked and answered. But um, this is obviously an emotionally charged issue. But what's really important to me now that we are at this juncture is that the current neighborhood surrounding this land is protected and you don't simply take advantage of a very old law that allows developers to disrupt progressive communities like Arlington that have worked very hard to ensure an ample amount of affordable housing is available to our residents. By the way, I grew up in this neighborhood as, as well, so I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, and when I wake up, and uh, I think most Arlington residents wake up and they think about the Mugar site, that's exactly what they think of, how vital it is to the well-being of those who live around it. And now, I may be wrong, but I think uh, your very bare application clearly denotes that when you think of this site, you simply think of what you see in the profit, and that doesn't sit well with me. Um, quite frankly, I'm shocked that the process has even got to this point. I mean, this plan lacks so many details, we can barely begin to have an adult conversation regarding this proposal, never mind a detailed response. Um, for example, um, in the project's capital budget, there's over $2 million dedicated to unusual site conditions slash other site work, but there's really no other details on what that means. Um, I believe that's over half the site work costs. Can you please uh, go into details on that? Uh, not at this time. No. Uh, th that seems to be a very common theme that I'm really uh, getting tired of hearing. Um, and going on, I was reading an article the other day in um, the Cambridge Day where uh, Ms. Noyes uh, stated that this project will not hurt but improve the hydrology of the area. But what we keep hearing tonight is that absolutely no studies have been done. So how can you stand by a statement like that? The, the, piece, the piece that, that, that is being referred to there is, um, if I can go back to the... If you, if you can see right here, mm -hmm. this narrowing of the higher pieces of land causes the surface water that comes down from the rest of the town to collect in this area. 
And we walked out there when we did the site visit. We walked to this, this portion of the land and could see that indeed this is almost like a pool area. It's the, 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 the surface water pools and these are the houses that have a particularly difficult time with the flooding. And the plans, the conceptual plans that we've worked on to date have specifically been addressing how to allow the flow of water from here to continue its natural path out this direction and relieve the ponding. I've been there when there was, you could float a canoe in the, in the water that was gathered there and had no way of, sca of escaping. So that's, that's a major piece of how we believe it's possible to improve the hydrology of the property. Thank you very much. And, and I do, again, appreciate saying that the plan to date, so we don't even know if that will be the plan that we can rely on moving forward. Um, so I, I also understand that this is a 17-acre lot. And I believe that by right under our current zoning, you can build three two-family homes on the property. And yet you are proposing to build upwards of 70 times uh, per 70 times the present by right allowed use and throughout your application you failed to present relevant data yet you continue to claim that there will be no adverse impact on the neighborhood and that just simply doesn't add up. Um, now I realize that you're not lawfully required to provide um, detailed plans at this stage and um, I'm sure you're you know not looking forward to continuing discussions um, like these but I, I really hope that we can take a step back um, where you can have time to create you know, a worthwhile and up-to-date plan that we can objectively consider and prior to um, having more discussions like this. Because I think it's really important that um, as we you know, try to formulate a, a response to your application, that we know what's going to be there. And that's simply not there right now. And um, as you can see, it's very frustrating for all of us. And um, you know, thank you for your time. And I hope you can... Uh, address these concerns moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, the Vice Chairman, Diane Mahan. Um, th thank you, Mr. Greeley. Uh, I purposely asked to go last because I kind of feel like um, I get to ask all the questions first and I wanted to make sure my colleagues had the opportunity. Um, Thank you for being here tonight. I understand this is the third time you've been before us, um, also on a site visit, um, which I accompanied um, the proponents from Oak Tree on. To sort of uh, piggyback on my colleague Mr. Uh, Dunn's question, I'm just wondering if I can get another cr crack at um, asking you to um, commit to not asking for a waiver of the Wetlands Protection Act. And the reason I do that is uh, that waiver, would I believe, would prevent our Conservation Commission the ability to take into account evidence of flooding of existence, existing residences and necessary remediation needed to mitigate. And I'm not just talking about the residents that, that are in your development in the 100-year floodplain, as well as some of the residents down on Sunnyside Lafayette Boulevard that are also in the 100-year floodplain. But I'm talking about the uh, outlying residences that, again, and I would ask you, um, perhaps if your engineer or someone could speak to this, um, what have you taken into, I see you've taken into account the 100 year floodplain scenario, but have you taken into account, and if you have, if you could share that with us in terms of the data, the non 100 year um, flooding events that typically flood our streets, as well as up to the 500 year flooding events? The uh, requirements of the regulations are that you, that you do not uh, make existing conditions worse with the proposed development. And what we've said several times tonight is that the goal would be to uh, ideally make existing conditions uh, e even better. But um, from a standpoint of the stormwater, uh, I mentioned earlier the DEP stormwater regulations, you're required to look at the, the two year, the 10 year, and the 100 year storms. So the two year is certainly a more frequent storm than the 100 year storm. and. Uh, it's, uh, we, we need to address um, the stormwater runoff requirements for those three design storms. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So, but from the bordering land subject to flooding thing that I mentioned earlier, that's a, under the Wetlands Protection Act regulations, that addresses the 100 year storm. So, but what the state requires you to do is to, and, I, and I'm sure the local bylaw does also, is to um, uh, compensate for the f fill, any filled flood storage at a uh, incremental level. So at the, you can't do all your filling at the upper levels of the storm, you have to do it at each level of the storm as you're going up. So that way you're inherently um, addressing the smaller storms as well as the larger storms. Right, but my question would be again, one of the things that concerns just about everybody in this room, if not everybody, is by going the 40B route, you're really circumventing a lot of the local bylaws, including Arlington's Wetlands Protection Act. Um, in Arlington, we know best basically what's going out here. Everybody knows by going 40B, you get a real lax um, interpretation from the state. So I'd just like, if I can get a yes or no, since everybody seems to be so civic-minded, and I know Ms. Noyes, I sometimes feel bad doing this, but you know, you do cite your community activities and your um, mission with the Cambridge Qu Quaker Friends, and I think you head the Earth Care Witness um, Committee. Um, it just seems to me it would comport in terms of um, all those um, adages that you put out there. Um, what I'm really looking for is that you will not see to, seek a waiver to the Arlington Wetlands Protection Act. Um, I think I should say first off the bat that we must be gluttons for punishment because we <laughs> keep coming back to try to share what we're about here. Um, the the uh, effort to date has been to address the two for one. We will continue to do that. We may, we may find ways of, of, um, of shrinking the footprint or whatever. So that, I mean, we're, that's our goal, to, to go for the two for one uh, regulation that the, that the town has. But will you commit to that, to the Arlington Wetlands? Um, you know, we're... we're I think you've heard you've heard several times this this meeting this evening is one that we volunteered to come to, knowing that the process that we're embarking on the next the next benchmark is the ZBA hearing and the Conservation Commission hearing for which we have brought in Meridian Mark Beaudry who will be heading a team that is going to be doing the detailed hydrology studies and resurveying, all kinds of things that are going to be providing us with the detailed information that everybody would like, including us. We were asked, we were invited to come tonight to repeat basically what we gave in our earlier presentation. We had no promises that we had detailed information to provide, but we're here, as I say, gluttons for punishment to provide what we can say. And I can say we will do everything we can to adhere to the two for one, but I'm, I, until I have a specific project in front of us and you, I won't be able to give you, a, 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 maybe we'll do two for 2.1 for one, I don't know. But let's, right. we'll, okay. we'll work I think with we're, us. we're probably gonna go back and forth. It's, it's really just a yes or no, and I'm, I'm just hearing a big loud no. Um, and which is really unsettling to me. Also, I've gone through the 196-page document submittal. Um, I know tonight it was stated the um, FEMA floodplain elevation of 7.6, but in the 196-page uh, submission to the board, it was stated at 7.81, um, which we also had various consultants look at themselves. And for me, just being a novice in terms of I'm not an expert on uh, flood elevation impacts, mitigation per storm event, per 100, per, per 500. I'm just gonna say myself personally, um, as a member of the Board of Selectmen, I took an awful lot of time going through that 196 page submission as well as um, speaking to other people. And it's been very frustrating to me, I do appreciate that you're here tonight, but it's been extremely frustrating to me that um, doing all that due diligence, then asking questions and being told, well, it's, we made these representations, but it's really not in there, we're gonna get it there later. Um, it's hard for me, especially when we went on the site visit with the gentleman from Mass Housing, there were representations um, made there concerning um, the site, the vegetation, um, as well as a berm that was going to be put in, as well as uh, a promise to restore a culvert. So I'm wondering if you could speak to any one of those when we went on the site visitation with, I'm gonna blank on the gentleman's name, 
Greg starts with a W. Watson, thank you very much. Um, you did speak about um, removing vegetation. My question would be, what studies have you done? Because my novice expertise would tell you, that's an oxymoron there. Um, my, my experience has been, when you remove vegetation, um, you're taking up a lot of the sponge, and according to some of the studies I've seen currently, up to 20% of the um, excess flooding that occurs in the site, um, by removing that, um, that would be impacted by at least 20% and just exacerbate the um, conditions on that. So if you could speak to that, as well as the berm that, that you cited um, on the site visit. And, and I only ask because this was represented to the gentleman from Mass Housing, to which you are seeking a project eligibility letter, and these were the representations made there. Um, re regarding the invasives, um, we have the uh, Rich Kirby, who was out there with us, the naturalist, was saying that, that the uh, extent to which the site is completely overgrown with, with brambles and, and uh, poison ivy and so on, he said this, was, this would be an impossibility to remove all of it. What he was suggesting is that um, part of our proposal to the town would be that there would be an ongoing program over a period of years whereby First, there would be paths that would go through the, through the uh, uh, brambles that would get people to where there, where there could be you know, a good destination. And, and then over, over a period of time, the invasives that are in the immediate area would be beaten back, you know, cut back and, and, and uh, minimized. But um, as has been pointed out, the site has been worked over and dumped on and abused by construction from Route 2 and so on, that there's quite a lot of remediation that is needed to, to get to the get-go. I guess my point would be that the vegetation that is in the plan that's before me, which is evolving as we speak, um, the, uh, invasive vegetation removal would increase the flooding by 20%. I understand you're saying you're going to commit to a number of years. Would you commit to as many as 10 to 12, which is what DCR has done in other projects when they've um, removed Japanese knotweed? They said the minimum for that is 10 to 12 years. I think this is one of the areas that we've, we've in our internal conversations, talked about having a partnership with the town and in, in generating, if, you know, 10 point some acres uh, that would be deeded in some fashion, which we can't describe because we haven't had that conversation with the town, but it, some way of preserving that land for public use and public improvement would be, uh, the plan would include what could be done on a year-to-year -year basis and what sort of partnership with the town could be crafted. I, I guess if I had my druthers um, where this is a for-profit project, um, I would not want to commit any Arlington funds to that. I would look to the developer. Another question I had, and I'm, I, I'm all for affordable housing. I spent some of my childhood years, and I didn't realize, I thought it was the projects, it's Monotomy Manor. Um, I understand your mission and your goal for affordable housing. I'm wondering if you will commit those affordable housing units to, um, to perpetuity, or are you going to skirt under the 40B law and just do 20 years? We don't skirt under that kind of thing. We, we, the, the, when you do a 40B or any other affordable housing, it is a permanent uh, commitment to the state and, and is goes into the deeds and is recorded in court, you know, and all kinds of things. So there's no way of taking that back, and that that's not the deal. So I guess I must be misinformed. I thought under 40B the affordable units are after 20 years no longer have to that it's not in perpetuity. So I, I guess I'll leave that for others to maybe I'm misinformed on that. I'll, I'll try to wrap it up. I think everybody knows where I'm going on this. I'm, uh, this is not a project um, that I even wanted to see everybody out here on a hot summer night in the middle of vacation. I'm sure a lot of you um, have ha had to work around that. Um, if I can just have your indulgence. Uh, it's been sp uh, represented that uh, the Route 2, I've heard back and forth. I'm hoping to get at least one question actually answered definitively here tonight. I've heard at the Hardy School as well as the sidewalk visit two different versions of whether you are or are not seeking access from Route 2. Could you definitively answer that? M meaning Route 2 access off the off-ramp to the Mugar Oak Tree site. 
This is a matter that has been discussed, um, and if, if you want to, we have a, a graphic here uh, that shows how that could be a possibility. We decided that um, to link providing a, 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 an off-ramp from Route 2 to the application that we've submitted would be complexifying what is already a complex project more than need be. However, that said, should this project get the approval from the state and should the community, the town of Arlington, desire to have an improved ramp from Route 2, it is possible that access to the property and from the property could go directly to that ramp. We got as far as speaking with people uh, in the Massachusetts Transportation Department and they believe that this has some, some beneficial aspects to it for, for everybody, for the traffic along Route 2 and for um, managing traffic to and from the property. So that is a distinct possibility should we get to that point and should the town decide they'd like to pursue that. Okay, and, and I also raise that because we're afforded the opportunity that we have some of our state legislators here. I'll just say the meeting that was held over in Cambridge when it was presented, the grade angle off of the off-ramp proposed into the Mugar site, um, according to Mass DOT standards, was the highest dangerous um, angle elevation considering rate of speed and how you would be entering there. So, um, but I'll leave that to state officials and others. I just wanted to, I was hearing that you weren't pursuing that, but it sounds like you are. Um, Lastly, um, a lot of residents outside of the 100-year floodplain um, who also experienced this, I said Viox at a previous meeting when Vox was um, being designed, uh, especially on Lake Street, we had several, including one very large sinkhole. Can you speak to the construction phase um, portion of this vis-a-vis -vis the, the por uh, pile borings, the um, construction vehicle management, your stockpile management plan, as well as any mitigation to um, outward residences that are affected by any of the construction in terms of foundation or other house structure um, damages. And then I'll make that my last question. I probably have 10 more. Uh, I'll, I'll try that simply by saying the construction management and, the, and controlling of dust and construction vehicles and all that is required at the zoning board level in terms of a management plan to be reviewed. That's way ahead of where we are right now. We have a lot of things to solve, as you've seen. So we'll solve those first, and we'll get to that at a later date. All right, I'm going to stop there, because I think this is sort of an exercise of what um, we've all been experiencing with this proposal. I definitely do appreciate you know, third time out, but it's, it's very frustrating to ask questions and be told over and over again, this too will come, this too will come. But there have been um, statements made that, you know, the flooding will be better, you know, if not the same, better. Um, I think everybody knows where I stand for the past 20 plus years. Um, Arlington has consistently since 1990 in their open space plan, plan most recently in their master plan, um, cited along with the Army Corps of Engineers as well as DCR. Army Corps of Engineers have put this in their highest priority, top two or three. DCR has put it in their um, top one or two for an area of wetlands that should be restored. Um, and at um, the very least for flood storage as well as I don't think you've adequately addressed your plan to send all the flooding to Route 2 which consistently Route 2 and Route 16 already are flooded during spring and um, fall events and shut down for I don't know how many rush hours per day per season. And I really think it's um, irresponsible for you to say whatever we can say on the flooding where it's going to go, we're going to send it all out to Route 2, which is going to impact not only Arlington, Belmont, Cambridge residents, but anybody who's coming down Route 2 to go to Alwife. So I, I stand firmly opposed to this project. I failed to mention Diane as our liaison in terms of this particular project from the uh, Board of Selectmen, uh, and I'm not smart enough to better the questions that have been asked by my colleagues. So uh, there's many of you here who also would like to speak tonight, and uh, luckily this Board of Selectmen is never alone when we're dealing with issues like this. 
We have an excellent uh, senator and two representatives that stand side by side with us and uh, help us on projects like this. So at this point, I'd like to call on Senator Ken Donnelly. And I guess I'm also calling on our two excellent reps, Sean Garbley and Dave Rogers. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The delegation is asked to speak for the delegation. And I want to say right up front that we stand united in support of the Board of Selectmen and stand united in opposing this proposal. Uh, we, what we have done in, over the last several months is we have met several times with the DCR commissioner to let the DCR commissioner and remind them of their commitment that this was a critical piece of property for the whole wetland area. We've met with the uh, department of um, the DOT, Department of Transportation, and mentioned the traffic problem, both of Route 2 and in that whole Lake Street area, and both urged them and asked them if there was any intention for a proposal for a curb cut or any other proposal to go from Route 2 to the DOT property, we would be notified immediately. And to this point, when we met with the DOT in District 4, there was no proposal, and they had not uh, said that they would. So I was surprised at some of the comments that were made here earlier on that. Uh, also, to let you know, we met with Mass Housing several times, and actually uh, we facilitated a meeting with the town, with both um, DCI and Mass Housing, to let Mass Housing know we adamantly oppose this proposal in this very environmentally sensitive area. Now, to say some of the reasons why, uh, both, I know Representative Rogers represents precincts 2, 4, 10, 12, and 14. Uh, Representative Gobley has the rest of Arlington, which includes, I think is very important, that some of the areas that affect not only this proposal is other areas of Arlington. And let me just give it a little bit of an example. When we had the so-called flood where some pictures were taken, both myself, Representative Gobley, and Dave's predecessor, Representative Brownsburg, who represented that area, was standing in the pouring rain where Alwife Brook meets the Mystic River. And by the way, that's where I grew up. I grew up down there as a kid, played in those areas, played in uh, Thorndike Field, and I remember Route 2, by the way, before it was Route 2. It was a nice white picket fence. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But as we were standing there in the pouring rain, the water from the Mystic River was going up the Alwife Brook, not the opposite way. So I'm not a hydrologist, and I don't understand a lot of the stuff, but I do know what I see, as both myself, Representative Brownsburg, and Representative Gobley saw water going back up into this area. And I also know that as a, a long time ago, playing Little League Baseball, when Thorndike Field actually had baseball fields in it, that when the flooding came, those fields flooded that way and towards my friends' homes that were on Mary Street, it did not go towards Route 2. Now that was probably 55 years ago, but I don't know, that, and that was before Route 2. So, but when we did see this water, and I wanna let the developers know this, when we saw this water flooding back, that's why when Winchester wanted to do flood mitigation, this delegation sent a letter, not only this delegation, but the delegation from Medford and Somerville sent a letter to Winchester asking to stop the flood mitigation in Winchester because what was happening to our Sunnyside area and our whole East Arlington area that got impacted by water coming from upstream. We also filed legislation to put a fourth pump in Amelia Earhart to make sure the water gets out into the ocean where it belongs instead of coming back into our neighborhoods. So 
this area, and that's why we called Mass Housing to say, not only does it is impact the residents around the Muga, it, rep it impacts all of East Arlington, East, all of Arlington, Cambridge, Belmont, and the whole surrounding area. So we will continue to oppose this proposal. We stand in support, this delegation stands in support of affordable housing. And when someone preaches to me who grew up in Arlington about housing, we are one of the most dense communities in the state, and 95% of it is residential. No other community that I represent or any of my 39 other colleagues in the Senate can say as much. Very few can say that as dense and 95% of it is residential for the Boston area. So I don't need to be preached upon about more housing. We support affordable housing. We will look forward to working with Oak Tree, the Board of Selectmen, and anyone else to make sure that we work on affordable housing, but not in this environmentally sensitive area. Thank you. So friends, now I have, we have 10 organizations that have asked to speak before us this evening, and all of you who are out there as well who would like to speak. So I'd like to give you two reminders, please. Two minutes per person, whether you're representing an organization or your own heart and mind and body when you get up here and speak. We have two microphones here, one to the left and one to the right. What I'm going to do is time, and at two minutes, I'm going to tap this twice, and I'm going to ask you to please bring it to a conclusion. Don't make me raise my voice. <laughs> so the first organization that is asked to speak, and what I'm going to do is ask this first organization to come over here to this microphone, which would be the Mystic River Watershed Association, while over here awaits the League of Women Voters speaker. So Mystic, Water Mystic River Watershed, League of Women Voters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is E.K. Kalsa. I serve as the Executive Director of the Mystic River Watershed <laughs> Association. For the past 15 years, the association has been deeply involved in an evaluation of water quality in the 76 square mile watershed. And I'd like to read two paragraphs from the letter which we'll submit into the record. <coughs> the Mugar property is located within the sub-watershed for Alewife Brook, which is an impaired tributary of the Mystic River. Ale White Brook drains approximately 4,500 highly urbanized areas made up of 47% impervious cover. The brook recently received a grade of D from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for its chronically poor water quality. Despite these many challenges, Myra and its partners remain committed to improving the quality of the waterway and its surrounding floodplains, wetlands, and uplands. This 17.7 acre property plays a very important role in Arlington and in the greater Mystic River watershed by providing flood storage, storage in the naturally pervious land and wetlands within its boundaries. But also, these lands filter pollutants and recharge groundwater. These functions are particularly important in this very vulnerable, low-lying section of East Arlington, which already experiences flooding during storms. The proposed development unfortunately, will replace 3.7 acres of this previously pervious land, mainly forested, to impervious buildings and pavement. Additional vegetated areas would be cleared and graded. The proposed change in land cover will significantly diminish the ability of this land to store, slow, filter, and inf infiltrate rainwater and flood water. We stand in opposition to the proposal as it's been prepared. Thank you, sir. So next from the League of Women Voters, while Sustainable Arlington comes up to this mic, please. League of Women Voters. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening to the Board of Selectmen and to all of you people from Oak Tree and especially to all of you good citizens. My name is Elizabeth Thompson. I have been a resident of Arlington since 1975 and first for 15 years in Precinct 2. Across and living across the street from Spy Pond, not on it, but looking at it, and walking kids to uh, Hardy School. So I'm quite familiar with the area, and I now live in Precinct 15 up in the hills where all of the drainage water that you folks down on the lowlands get come from. Um, and that is actually part of what I noticed when I was going through my notes. Um, when the Alewife Brook was planned, the Alewife Station was planned in the 1970s, I actually had been in Arlington long enough to volunteer to serve on the League of Women Voters uh, Committee to review the environmental impact statement. So my memory goes back perhaps a little bit longer maybe even than some of the selectmen in terms of what eventually went into that and the things that we had to look at. A lot of them had to do with uh, drainage and flooding concerns. What would happen when the station was built? What kind of a footprint would the 2,000 car garage put on top of all these wetlands? All of which were properties that belonged to Ar Arlington, Belmont, and Cambridge that were all part of a greater area called the Great Swamp back in a map in 1866. And all of that water eventually ended up trying to go into Cambridge on the far side, but was blocked by hills. And so that was one of the things that stuck in my mind. We wrote the uh, part of the citizens' comments that went uh, to the great volumes, and when you read these things, it's weightlifting. I recommend it for your ongoing health. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the EIS, that's the Environmental Impact Statement, was made available to the town for review in Robbins Library and also the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Office. Beg your pardon? I'm sorry, it's two minutes. Two minutes. It's that's the end of it? That was, that okay. Was the end. It was uh, a wonderful two minutes. All right. Well, think, think about this. The mastodon who lost his tooth in Spy Pond is still looking for it. He lost it when the glaciers were receding. They left us the landscape that drains continually downward towards the ocean. It's never changed, and we can't engineer it away, and we can't get uh, global warming to disappear. And it's going to give us more rain to deal with. Happy swimming, everybody. <laughs> And while, and, uh, then over here, we're going to have waiting the friends of Spy Pond Park. Uh, hi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that better? Yeah. All right, so I am chair of Sustainable Arlington, and I don't know who's talked about climate change tonight, but obviously that's a real issue here. What we're expecting is more intense rain. We already have more intense rain. We will have more flooding. We have sea level rise. And actually, if you're interested, you can find maps that will show you what it will do to Arlington. So I'm also chair of the trustees of the uh, Spy Pond Condo Association. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about flood insurance. So uh, when the FEMA map was changed in 2009, our insurance company planned to increase our premium from $10,000 a year to $54,000 a year. That's five times as much. So we spent $11,000 for a survey of the property to prove that only one of the buildings was in the floodplain. Um, obviously, with climate change, it's going to get worse. We're going to have more flooding in this area, more rain. And so I think that for the, especially the people who don't have a whole lot of money who would be in this project, whether or not they'll be able to afford flood insurance, if it's even available at that point, is a good question. Is it fair to put them in a property where they could be flooded and ruined? I don't think so. And I guess that's probably it. <laughs> Keep that applause going. She was under 10. <laughs> so we have over here the Friends of Spy Pond Park, while over here, please, the Arlington Land Trust. Friends of Spy Pond Park. Oh, that was her. Oh, excuse me. Oh, who did I say? Oh, Arlington Land Trust is next then? 
Oh, Arlington's Open Space Committee, Annie. Is Annie LaVoria? Passed too? She looks surprised. I, I was given this list. I don't know, Annie. Um, I'm Anne LaRoy, the chair of the Open Space Committee, and we just completed our uh, fifth, I believe, open space plan, which from the very beginning, since the 1990s, when the open space plans, which are a state-mandated document, which have to be approved by the state, um, the mu protection of the Mugar land has always been a top priority uh, in terms of trying to acquire or protect it through conservation restrictions or any, any con plan. So I just um, want to be sure that's part of the record, that people are reminded that it's over 20 years now um, that this organization has been working to try to protect the Mugar property for the town. Uh, many people have been working on it much longer than that. So I think we're all in pretty much agreement that this is an area that should be protected for natural resource protection and potentially environmental education, which um, is another use that would be very valuable there. Thank you. So uh, next I have the Arlington Soccer Club. And after that over here we're going to have the East Arlington Liv Livable Streets next. Soccer Club for us, sir. Good evening. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for Oak Tree's presentation. Um, my name is Henry Brush, and I'm the president of the Arlington Soccer Club. Uh, the Arlington Soccer Club is a nonprofit uh, volunteer organization here in town. Uh, we have approximately 1,900 players that participate in our league. Uh, and they range in age from 5 to uh, 18 years old. Uh, we also have approximately 300 coaches that uh, participate in our volunteer organization. They're all Arlington uh, citizens, mostly parents uh, of the children. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, youth soccer organizations in the state. Um, there's been a lot of discussion tonight about the impact uh, to the immediate neighbors of the Mugar property development, proposed development. Uh, and those are certainly valid concerns, uh, but I would also like to give Another perspective that shows how this impacts actually the entire town. Um, so field space is a significant challenge for the ASC and all youth sports organizations in Arlington. Uh, fortunately, we have very large participation in, uh, in sports, both youth and adult. Uh, on Wednesday, Wednesday nights during our spring season, this past season, which is uh, the, season, the night that I coach, uh, and I practice at Thorndike, um, and it's a typical night on those fields, we had 19 teams and 200 players uh, practicing on on Thorndike Field, and also Magnolia as well. And on a typical weekend, we have about 20 games there. Um, we have similar crowding on other fields that we have in town. And if we were to lose that town, time on Thorndike and Magnolia, uh, you can see, uh, through increased flooding, you can see that would be a significant impact on our youth soccer program. Um, we have no place to move those players, and this would be uh, uh, obviously a big impact to us. And actually, I, I share the senator's experience. One of my elegant duties as a board member is I get to check the fields. and. Uh, I can, I can share with you that uh, Thorndike still does flood, uh, and it's one of my sort of negative barometers. So if I go down to Thorndike at 6 a.m. and it's dry, I pretty much know the rest of the town is probably good. So um, I just wanted to voice that concern, and uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. So East Arlington Livable Streets. Going once, going twice, gone. Uh, East Arlington Good Neighbor Committee. George. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. I uh, just want to make it very clear that we, from the East Arlington Good Neighbor Committee, we're the group that has put the boots on the street to organize the neighborhoods and the people who reside in the vicinity of the project, proposed development. Uh, we're totally opposed to this development in, this, in the proposal that's been submitted at this point in time, and we're against any incarnation that may come up in the future. You can tweak it all you want, but we will fight this plan door by door, street by street, until the plan is completely defeated and the property is left in better condition, frankly, than it will be when it is developed. Thank you very much. We have folks speak. Yes. Good Neighbor Committee? Me? Huh? George just spoke for the Good Neighbor Committee. Pardon? George just spoke. On he has behalf a minute left. Huh? He had a minute left. He has a minute left. Elsie, you have a minute. Uh, Elsie Fiore, 58 Mott Street. 
I, uh, those four houses you see up on the left, I'm right in that area, and this, they're pretending not to come down behind our houses. However, they're going to use Little John Street as a way into the project, and that's going to affect all of us down in that area because the streets are one way, so that not only means they're going to use the streets, they're going to have to change those streets for being two-way to help the people who live there, and then we're going to have a merry time with traffic. Uh, I, I had, uh, if I just could take an extra minute, please, get my glasses on. Uh, somebody spoke earlier about uh, this place being called the Great Swamp. And lo and behold, I have a book called The Great Swamp that a friend of mine who's now in her 90s down in Cambridge wrote many years ago. And um, I just looked and found that I was quoted in it. And uh, it says, uh, and it kind of says nice things about me. So I'm going to let you know what it said. In Arlington, Elsie Fury feels, now this is uh, 2000 and uh, I think 2000 or something like that. Um, Elsie uh, Fury uh, feels she succeeded in winning support for her neighbors and many other residents in her efforts to protect the Muca land on Route 2 from development. Her charm and her persistence over 40 years and the use of legal measures have been useful. Uh, as a matter of fact, I uh, brought a suit against uh, one of the Muga projects a few years ago myself because all of these people didn't come to meetings in those days. It was just me. So. Any, anyway, so I said, I have had a vision for the Mugar site since I moved to Arlington many years ago. As a matter of fact, 65 years ago. I'm actually very old. While waiting and hoping for my vision to be realized, I've watched what was once farmland turn first into a rather barren place and then gradually through the years turn into a parcel of open land fringed by trees and other greenery. The land has acted as a sponge to absorb water from the 100-year floodplain and the greenery has created a haven for birds and small animals and a pleasant gateway to Arlington on Route 2. And we also have a deer that visits us. I'll see you on, sorry. It is charming, but... Yeah, right, two, okay. Two and a half minutes over, please. All right. Uh, uh, could I just say why we didn't get it before? It, is it that at long? At this time, no. Two, two lines, two lines. Unfortunately, at this time when the Mugar site was being proposed years ago, the town of Arlington had just purchased the bankrupt Sims Hospital on Hospital Hill and had little cash to acquire more open space in East Arlington. And in turn, the town's land trust was devoting its limited monies to prevent encroachments on Spy Pond. Therefore, the Mugar site continues to be in danger of development. Still, we've all learned never to under underestimate our powers of persuasion. So let's keep on opposing the development of the Mugar site. I don't like messing with Elsie, I can tell you. <laughs> Only one I let go over time, you know what I'm saying. So now, friends, what we'd like is to invite any of the rest of you who are here. For, thank you so much for coming out, uh, showing this kind of interest and concern for our town. And what I'm going to ask is if you're interested in speaking, that you come and line up behind either one of these two mics. Okay, now. You can go now. Uh, and let me remind you, please. Two minutes, same thing. I'm going to give you this double tap when it's uh, two minutes are up. And I ask you, please, to bring it to a conclusion. Finish your sentence. And I ask you, please, to keep in mind what we're doing. The Board of Selectmen have to uh, put together comments related to this project by Monday evening. So to whatever degree you can help us with what your recommendations should be about comments that we might make, I think you saw uh, what a, a spectacular group these four individuals are and are well capable and, and certainly have formed a lot of comments already. But so please keep that in mind, two minutes each person, and we will start right there. My name is, thank you very much. My name is John Urowich, 47 year resident of Arlington, 39 as a homeowner, 33 at the corner of Martin, Little John Street. Have seen little change over there other than good stuff. Now we have this behemoth gonna be built right down the street. Just because the state waves a 40B trump card over the town, we don't want that. 
What's going to happen is they're going to go in there with their chainsaws and bulldozers, mow everything down, and come in with 304 parking spaces, which, in case you don't know what that means, you can't see it on that, drive by the Arlington, the East Arlington Walgreens, and it's at least four times the size of that parking lot. Picture that in there, okay? All the little animals, the birds, the deer, the fox, the turtles, the snakes, the skunks, the possums, everybody else, they're going to have to get their own affordable housing when this is mowed down, okay? Think of that. Nobody mentioned the critters already, okay? Now, <laughs> right on. Consider that three and a half hours, twice a day, we get traffic jams on Lake Street. You get some 911 call, medical, fire, or police that have to get from one side of the island to the other on Lake Street or down Mary Street, which is a drag strip, okay? That's not going to happen. I don't want to be looking for my last gasp of air waiting for the ambulance, okay? Because we've got 300 more cars coming off of Little John Street, which is a dinky little roadway, okay? That feeder, Butch Street, I mean, it's just 300 more cars. It's a, it's a leave it to beaver neighborhood. There aren't 20 cars that go down there all day long. They're going to put 300. My, my bottom line here is everybody in this room has said, no, we don't want it. I don't know whether the message is lost here. We don't want it, okay? That's how. Thank, thank you. in the neighborhood. I couldn't agree more about the traffic. I think something to consider is all the additional accidents that will happen out on Lake Street because there'll be so many more people trying to turn left to get to Route 2. And any access from Route 2 is only going to lead to cut through in our neighborhood and more accidents in our neighborhood. Access from Route 2, unless that's the only access, is a problem. However, I'm here to talk about flooding. Um, First of all, the best conservation vision is no development. That's everything that you've said is so disingenuous because we can, if we had public access, we could get rid of invasives. We could get rid of the fill that's there. We could unclog the drain under Route 2. But the other thing to remember is everything drains into Alewife Brook. When it rains, Alewife Brook level rises. There is no elevation change for stormwater anywhere. That's why we have so much flooding, because the groundwater comes up, there's no elevation change between Alewife Brook and all the storm sewers. Everything backs up. You can put compensatory storage in, but you know, I'm an engineer too, it's over time those things don't stay, in the integrity does not stay. So it's going to <laughs> end up being part of the problem rather than part of the solution. However, the biggest thing is with Arlington's Conservation Commission bylaw is using up-to-date rainfall levels when you're calculating the 100-year flood, the 10-year the tw flood, the two-year flood. You, Massachusetts regulations are so out of date. This is a huge problem. They are relying on data from the 50s and 60s on what a 100-year flood rainfall is. I have lived through, in less than 20 years, three of those 100-year floods. They are not. This, that data is so out of date. And how anybody can live with themselves and say that they're going to make things better using that old, old data that is completely irrelevant. We know with climate change, we know we got a lot of problems. You've got to use up-to-date, real data. And that is what the Conservation Commission's bylaw demands and you are going to skirt around that by trying to use the state rules. It's un it's, it's criminal. <laughs> uh, Steve Revelock, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. I think I've been completely upstaged on the topic of flooding, so I'm going to ask a few questions about affordable housing instead. Uh, so earlier in the presentation, I believe... You may ask Okay, well, comments, if you would. Okay, well, I was in the, the questions I would have asked, if I could have gotten an answer, would be the number of uh, affordable units available, the percent AMI that these units were targeting, and um, the, per, the AMI value that was being used. So in short, I just was really looking for a sense of, yes, we're getting affordable housing, but how affordable? Um, and who, is, who are we really trying to help out with it? Or who is, who is intended to be helped out? But, um, 
Um, I will leave it at that. Thank you. No, no, wait. You, you have a minute. So, can, could anybody give a quick answer over there? I, b I believe we're talking 25% affordable, not 20. I think we're talking about 80% of medium. We're probably setting the rents at 70%, so there's a window. Okay. Uh, and um, that's that's the AMI value. How That's the affordability. The, the lottery process, as you probably know, covers more than just the town, but they get priority mm -hmm. if they prove that the need is there. And then there's a balance of the state, there's handicapped accessibility, there's all those kinds of things go into it. Okay, but 80% AMI, you said? Yes. Okay, thank you. John Dalskis, town meeting member, Precinct 18, and most of you probably know of my activities the past 15 years trying to get this misbegotten 40B law either reformed or repealed. Uh, just a couple of points. You've talked enough about the wetlands. I live up in the Heights. I am not affected, but I am very concerned for my friends down in East Arlington that I know will be affected. Uh, a couple of things that came up that I just want to bring to your attention. Uh, they intimate that we had 40 years to get our 10 percent. There's no way in God's green earth that we will ever reach 10 percent. The last time I looked, we'd have to build something in the order of eight to 12,000 homes, but it keeps eroding, and I can explain that at another time. Uh, intimated that we haven't done well at our 5.6 percent, or wherever we're at now, the number of changes. There's only 35 other towns, possibly 38, that have done better than us in that regard. So we have worked on affordable housing. And we were doing things long before 40B that created affordable housing. We have more public housing units created by the town of Arlington than any other city or town except our major cities. We're number 11 out of 351 cities and towns that have provided public housing. And that's there forever, okay? Uh, the other issue is, uh, can we make 10%? I seriously doubt it. Not without making this look like New York City. So there's got to be a balance here someplace. We've done a lot of work to create affordable housing. If we could get half the things we've done here in Arlington enacted through our state legislature, perpetuity of the developed units, Inclusionary zoning that says every major development has components. These are the things that would make 40B truly produce affordable housing, not line the pockets of developers that I, I, I'm embarrassed to see them here, to tell you the truth. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kelly Lee Moss, and I live on Edith Street. And if you watched the heavy rains yesterday, nope. Hi, my name is still Kelly Lee Moss. I live on Edith Street, and if you watch the heavy rain yesterday and wonder where some of that rain goes, it comes down to not my neighborhood. Past the little narrow opening that you say it doesn't flow, but that's where it goes. Okay. I've lived here for 20 years, and that's good. I've seen some pretty heavy rains. I can see the entrance to Thorndike Field from my house, and I've watched it turn from pavement to a pond. I've watched ducks swimming in the neighbor's yard. I can look out my front window and see Thorndike Field, field and watched kayakers paddling across it. Did I mention it's a field? And to my right is the Mugar land, precious, soggy, functioning land. Trees and vegetation acting as a natural sponge, a giant bowl that holds all that rainwater just below and at the surface. And it's all good, because I knew when I bought that house from the in-laws, who have lived here for 40 years, that it's a floodplain. Water in the basement is a fact. It's OK. Two sump pumps, I have them. Everything three feet above ground level, mm-hmm, done. Finished basement for my teenagers, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, I get it. It's, I go with the flow, right, Joe? <laughs> um, of course, six years ago, the floodplain maps changed because of all the nearby development. It cost me an extra $800 every year. That's just doubled. I'm sure it's going to double again. Um, it just boggles my mind that it can be legally build and pave over that working land. The neighborhood community has to be considered. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And you want to build in the name of housing? What about our housing, the houses that are already there? My horsehair plaster walls will not withstand the pounding of the pilings. Uh, it's morally and environmentally irresponsible to build and pave on this land. It doesn't make sense. 
doesn't make sense, it makes dollars. It must be a huge payoff for the Mugar family if they're willing to give millions of dollars to the developers to build it. Some real green developers, for sure. The town might make some money, but residential revenues have additional municipal costs associated with it. It's the current residents of this town, it's all of us, who won't benefit from the increased flooding, the traffic, and the safety concerns. We're the little guy that's going to have to really pay the price. And the funniest part of this whole development is that they are prom promoting it as a land conservation. The definition of conservation is preservation, protection, or restoration of the natural environment, natural ecosystems, vegetation, and wildlife. Fortunately, I don't have time to sing Pave Paradise, put up a parking lot. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I hope you hear our voices clearly, and I thank you for all your support. Neil Bertie, I live off of Spy Pond Parkway. Uh, Ms. Reyes and colleagues, do you live in the East Arlington area? Will you ask me? Uh, Ms. Noyes and um, you know, her colleagues, do you live in the East Arlington area? I've been in this area for 12 years, relative newcomer. I walk to Alewife almost every day for the past 12 years. And I cannot tell you how much this area has changed. Between traffic, people are really pissed off when they get off Lake Street. So they're zooming right through our streets. I'm afraid to let my kids walk across the street or on the road or to play anywhere. Um, I'm a commercial banker by trade. I believe in balance of making profits and balancing with community needs, but you know, let's calculate profits per unit, 15, 16 million roughly, versus the community needs. I mean, how do we balance that? The safety of people, the environmental concerns. Again, it's good to make money. Everybody is entitled to that, but when we see all these things happening in our community, it's not about affordable housing. 25%, 100% of those units affordable housing, that area can't sustain a single new house, period. So I don't even know, you know, shame on us in Massachusetts for allowing a good law intentionally, and we need to do something about reforming it, to be abused that way as it's a slide right around way of making money. I mean, my, money making has to be ethical and balanced with envi environmental and community needs. Thank you, I'm definitely against it. Thank you. Sorry. Hukumbwa Sauti, um, representing the East Arlington Good Neighbor Committee and all our relations. Um, any major construction development that affects not only the human community in fundamental ways, but also the natural environment and ecosystem has to be considered fully from information shared openly and in a timely manner for all the stakeholders, aside from the developers, to observe and give full feedback on. It had come to our attention at a uh, recent community meeting that the developers had expressed that their development reports made available to the community were not completely up to date or a full expression of the scope of the development. This clearly does not show egalitarian relationships in good faith with the community or at adequate professional levels. I and others feel that this incomplete communication severely hamper hampers the ability of the community and other stakeholders to make decisions to be aware of, of harmful environmental outcomes, fully assess community traffic patterns and public safety, or consider the ultimate impacts to present or new residents and to local and regional flora, fauna, and natural ecosystems. On the international stage, free, informed, and prior consent is something advocated and fought hard for with respect to how corporations relate to local residents and indigenous peoples. The importance of full and open communication with the impacted populations and communities is no less grave and important in this local setting. The incomplete and unfinished reports that have been disseminated up to this point severely put this kind of necessary ethical consent in serious jeopardy. Thank you. My name is Ted Peluso. I've lived here maybe six years, I guess. Nice town. Uh, I was going to ask a simple question, which was, tell me the number one reason why you're bringing something special to this town versus the negative sides. And then the fellow over there mentioned the word critters. And it suddenly occurred to me, are there critters living in there? I mean, I know there are homeless people living in there, which from what I understand, they were supposed to get rid of them someplace along the line, even though it wasn't developed. 
But let's think about what happens besides the water. So you, stay, you take a, a big piece of that and you say, I'm gonna make this into a livable area. Where did the critters go? And you know what scares me? I've seen some of the critters around Arlington recently. And you know where they're gonna go? They're gonna go into the neighborhoods. And I would love to see these folks do a little survey to find out how many rats are living in that swamp when they're gonna take away their habitat. Ava Bidegger, I live in that neighborhood and I wanted to paint a little bit of a picture of the traffic uh, in the neighborhood based on the data that was shared with us at the May meeting where we were assured that because there's only an expected one third of people that will be commuting by cars, there's only 80 cars going through the neighborhood during rush hour trying to get on Lake Street at a clip of one car per minute. Now, if you picture the streets in that neighborhood, they're small, like many streets in Arlington, there is a car parked on the right, a car parked on the left, enough space for one car to go down the middle. Now, if people are going down to Thorndike Field while people are trying to get out of the development at one car per minute, that's going to create a traffic hazard. If the traffic is backed up, as it already is in the morning, to get out on Lake Street, both going towards Mass Ave on Margaret Street and going towards Route 2 on Little John, uh, that traffic jam, you know, they'll be sitting on those streets for a long time, creating safety hazards that John already alluded to. If there's a 911 call and vehicles have to get through, they'll be sitting in traffic. They won't be able to get through. We have mothers walking. There are strollers on the street because the sidewalks are too small. Where are they gonna walk? The children are riding on the street because the sidewalks are small trying to get to the bike path. It's going to create a big safety hazard and the neighborhood is just too small. The streets are too small to handle the volume of traffic and we've been assured it's only one third and I don't believe those numbers quite frankly. Thank you. Hello, my name is Neil Saunders. I've lived in the neighborhood for 16 years. I didn't prepare a speech, but uh, I'm just gonna say what I think. And I think Oak Tree is here to just kind of quiet everyone down. Their goal is to make as much money as they can, as fast as they can, with as little resistance. And whether they find some laws to get around us, you know, that's what they're gonna do. Uh, there's a, a development right now in Belmont off of Acorn Park. I'm sure many of you are aware of it. I feel bad because I didn't stand with those people when they were demonstrating, and now they, they tore down all the trees, the roads along Lake Street are all torn up, and this is what they're proposing for our side too. You know, they, they really haven't talked about our quality of life, the flooded basements, the more traffic, the crowded schools. You know, the, the, their goal is to make as much money as they can. Um, I've seen when it rains, the water shooting out of the, the, uh, the storm drains like a fountain in the middle of the street. You know, I haven't heard much in terms of studies that they've done. They, they, they show great pictures. They sh I'm sure they have their financials all in line of how much they can make, but you know, they haven't really done any of these in-depth studies that I keep talking about. I think what their goal is, try and find as many loopholes as they can and get this pushed, in, you know, pushed through as fast as they can. But I'm glad that the rest of uh, uh, our neighbors have shown up and they're, they're showing support. And I, I think, I hope that has weight and with, with the town committee members too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, Adam Street. I'd like to address Mr. Kuro's comments and offer a different perspective on them. I'm not at all convinced that this town has made the preservation of the Mugar site a priority. Um, you know, in our society, money talks. And as far as I know, this town has never put, um, been willing to spend a dime to preserve that site. At this year's town meeting, despite the representations of the Community Preservation Act Committee, that if that act was passed, funds from it could be used, used for preserving Mugar. Town meeting voted against 
spending any money of the, any of the CPA funds on the acquisition of this site. And indeed, that, um, that position was favored by people like Ms. Rowe in an utter act of hypocrisy, who was one of the main CPA supporters. And your board, your board, your board went along with that. I'm calling on you to call a special town meeting to reverse that vote, to show that this town is willing to spend money to preserve that site. And I think if you don't do that, and if you take the position that we're going to deny every permit for any type of development on that site, you're taking a position that is both irresponsible and untenable. As your friend and my favorite town meeting member likes to say, that's an invitation to litigation. I would also like you to consider what might happen if a 40B development doesn't go in here. You know, this site is not like an HCA development where they need a lot of zoning relief. That site, by my calculation, can support 600,000 square feet of development. What this developer is proposing is less than half of that. Sure, there are wetlands issues that need to be dealt with, but I think you need to think very carefully about what the alternatives might be, because I think you could very well end up with a different development that doesn't give you the social benefits. And I'd like you to just list a few demands that I would like you to make in your letter to Mass Housing. First, Two minutes, thank you. Thank you. My name is Aram Holman, 12 Whittemore Street. I have some recommendations, I have some comments, and I have some questions which, since I can't ask the proponents, I will ask the Board of Selectmen to follow up on. Um, some of the recommendations, uh, the difference, the only difference between the uh, Mugar site and Florida swampland is that this is in Massachusetts and it has no alligators. Other than that, they're the same. Uh, I wouldn't develop on Florida swampland. I'd respectfully suggest to Mr. Mugar, though I believe he's not here, that he either take a conservation easement or donate the land uh, and put an end to these repeated attempts to try to develop it. A uh, couple of other recommendations. Uh, for our state representatives and senators who were here, I appreciate their being here. One thing I'll request that they try to do, if at all politically feasible, is to amend Section 40B so that 40B no longer trumps local conservation bylaws. And that would give us some of the important protections that we should have by law instead of having to beg the developers when it's not in their interest. Uh, I'd like to ask the Board of Selectmen if they would proactively downzone some sections of Arlington, there is no need anymore for an R5, R6, or R7 district. And these are the things that developers blackmail Arlington into doing 40B on. Uh, they use these. I can build these big projects. Let's do it now before it becomes a taking. That's something that the Board of Selectmen and town meeting can do. These things are all doable. Couple of comments. Um, I would, you know, I have dealt with, thank you. Mr. Greeley, uh, thank you. And uh, um, John Warden, uh, Jason Street, uh, lived in the town for quite a little while. I'd like to go over a little bit of uh, just a little bit of history about this tract. Back in the 60s, there was a billboard. This was before the forest was there. There was a billboard there that said, "Future site of Star Market." And one night we were driving home from a party or something in Boston, and the sign was burning. Well, that was the end of the Star Market, I guess. <laughs> uh, some, somewhat later. In the town meeting of 1970, the first one I was in, and I think very few except Mrs. Fiore may remember this, uh, the Mugar family brought in a proposal. Well, they didn't bring it in. They got the planning board, the old planning board, to bring in planned unit development. And Mr. Stephen Mugar, who made a fortune in the star market and later selling it, stood on the floor of this hall speaking at a town meeting and urged the town meeting to vote for this PUD, which was going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread. And a bunch of us opposed it. 
uh, we lost. Uh, the PUD develop, uh, zoning was put in. Um, 1970, 45 years have elapsed, and they haven't done a thing with it. So my question, if I were allowed to ask a question, Mr. Chairman, would be, why don't the Mugars want to develop it under the PUD zoning, which they asked this town to enact for their benefit? Thank you. Um, Mr. Warden is also a town meeting member, so I just wanted to get up here because Mr. Engler, I'm not sure if he's aware that there are many town meeting members in this room. I don't know, maybe like 30. Oh, yeah. How many town meeting members? Okay. And a lot left. Um, and I want to say that I also thought Mr. Engler's comment that we don't care about affordable housing in this town is completely wrong. Town meeting voted for the CPA, and the reason I personally voted for the CPA is for open space, and I saw some of the slides during the presentations of affordable housing units in other towns, and I thought that's the kind of thing I'd like to see in Arlington, a beautiful Victorian with affordable housing units in it, and that is what we intend to do. So we're not just going to ignore affordable housing. We just don't want a monstrosity on Route 2, and as somebody who has to commute daily to Route 2, it's a mess. I, I, I hope you guys can all get in your cars and drive both ways at 7, to 8.30, 9 o'clock, and you can see there's no way we can sustain something. So again, CPA, town meeting members, that's what we intend to do in Arlington, and overwhelmingly, people also voted for it. So I think you need to take that into consideration. Master plan, CPA, town meeting members, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Laura Notman. I'm a resident in the Heights, so I'm not directly impacted. Um, and I'm an architect, and I fully understand what the challenges are of the process of proposing a project like this, and that there are costs and time involved in preparing materials for presentation. Um, and I came tonight with an open mind. I hadn't been to the previous presentations, so I really wanted to see what uh, you had to present in terms of solutions to the very well-known and well-described challenges with the site in terms of wetlands and um, traffic. And, uh, you know, I, I believe there are potentially design solutions to some of these issues, though I'm much more skeptical after having heard everyone's comments. But my real concern is when I listen to you describing your process um, and that the point we're at right now, which is asking for the uh, mass housing site approval. Um, and that only requires preliminary design. Um, but you describe that the charge that they have is to help determine the economic feasibility of a project. And looking at this site and the distance you've been able to come in terms of your analysis, I don't think there's any way that they could do an, an, an assessment of the feasibility of this project because there are so many unknowns Yes, perhaps you're carrying a contingency for site work that you don't know about because you haven't fully evaluated the site, but uh, I really question whether this is feasible to develop economically. And I think the Mugars have rights as property owners, and I don't see developers as inherently evil. Um, you know, there's some great projects that have happened even here in Arlington. But I really feel like if you want to go before mass housing and say this is a feasible project, you're going to need to do more than the minimum required in terms of analysis and uh, really do your homework to present that. And I don't think the town should accept the proposal without more work having been shown. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here in the middle of a hot summer night. My name is Allison Link, and I think I might be the first Belmont resident to speak tonight. And I and many others were very actively involved with trying to preserve the Belmont Uplands for over a decade, including state representatives and uh, people who were doing it totally um, volunteering and town meeting met town meeting members fundraising, um, you know, phonathons, everything. Um, as you know, sadly, we lost that fight. It's kind of ironic because walking here with one of my colleagues who was involved with that fight, we saw our first, uh, our first uh, I think, silver maple now turning orange on our way walking here. Um, so very poignant. But I just, I have to say, I did also go to the meeting 
at the Hardy School back in May, and it is just so inspiring to see how everybody is pulling together, um, you know, to try to save this very crucial space. It has so many parallels to the Belmont Uplands in terms of its crucial flood absorption, concerns about traffic. I actually grew up in the house that I now live in, in Belmont, which is right on the other side of Little Pond from Route 2, and I can tell you, all the little critters that were in the Silver Maple Forest, they're over in the Mugar land now, and where are they gonna go when that's taken? Um, and just the schools, traffic, um, it's just, it's really a crime, I think, what's happening with 40B. And I just want to mention that Mr. Engler was present at um, many ZBA meetings that I was also present at and uh, speaking on behalf of the developer of the Uplands and preserving 40B, and we know how that ended up. So please stay strong. Comments, Deanne DuPont, town meeting member, Precinct 13. Precinct 13 is on a hill in Arlington, and you would not think that if you're on a hill that you would experience flooding. However, once the house next to me uh, was torn down and then a house with a larger footprint was put there, as well as a larger parking pad and removal of trees, I now flood. The builder had no responsibility towards me because I now flood and have to deal with the water. So now I had to spend lots of money to mitigate that problem. So are you um, going to have lots of contingency money? So for the next 50 years, anyone who has flooding issues because of the development, you are willing to compensate them for lost work time, loss of, of property damage, decreased value of their homes compared to what other homes in Arlington are increasing by the percentage, you know, because it it's, would be on a relative basis. And if on a relative basis, East Arlington isn't increasing at the rate of the rest of it because they're flooding, then I think the builders and the developers need to be responsible that, for that for let's say 50 to 100 years. And are you willing to be able to do that? And I don't think that most developers consider the impact of what removing a tree does, that there's a lot of water absorption in there and a lot of cooling impact. And I don't, I unfortunately had a board meeting, so I didn't see the beginning of it, so you may have covered it, that, you know, every tree and every shrub that's removed, here is the, you know, impact to it. Thank you. Hi, I want to thank the Board of Selectmen for holding this hearing and uh, keeping this room open for all these comments. I'm Glenn Koenig. I'm a former town meeting member. I've lived in Arlington for 40 years. Uh, I'm the person who made the video that you can see on YouTube. Uh, I actually shot a lot of that video, put on my rubber boots, and went out there and sloshed through the water to get those images. Uh, when Brian sent me a photograph from 1953 showing the swamp, uh, I realized I was only three years old then, and I'm 65 now, almost. And uh, that was a long time ago, and all this time, uh, many, many proposals have come up, and I was on town meeting for years, uh, to try to build something on this land. And as you can see, nothing's been built yet. So I, I kind of have to ask the proponents, what part of no don't you understand? <laughs> uh, many years ago, a uh, president of the United States uh, was quoted, which you're probably all familiar, saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So I'm asking, oops, I went to the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mugar, let go of this land. Winnell Evans, Arlington Play, um, uh, Orchard Place. Um, I want to urge everybody here to read the mass housing application that has already been filed by Oak Tree. Uh, it's, it's really interesting and very informative. They have indeed already filed for an exemption from the um, uh, flood storage requirements. Um, I did read their um, also original early proposal before the May meeting in which they said that, quote unquote, groundwater is not in our purview. Um, I lived in that neighborhood for about 10 years. I went through several hundred year storms. I also saw a manhole cover two feet above street level where it was being pushed by the water going through the storm system. 
And I think that to say that there's a difference between groundwater and stormwater at a certain point is, as many people have said tonight, disingenuous. They, they are one and the same at a certain point. Um, I also noticed when I read through the housing application that Oak Tree has filed for 28 waivers um, from, from various requirements, including uh, a waiver from our existing wetland regulations. And the one that really stuck with me, it's kind of small, but it really, really ticked me off. Uh, they are looking for 25% reductions of various filing, legal, and building fees, which they are asking for on behalf of building 25% um, affordable units in this. This is on behalf of a for-profit project for one of the wealthiest men in Massachusetts, okay? I want to request from the, the selectmen and any other board that may be involved in this that they do not get a dime off of any of the fees. I realize this is a small part of it and it's a drop in the bucket with the money that we're talking about, but that is really offensive. And I'll close it. to all the speakers, and I think you all should give yourself a nice round of applause for being here on such a warm summer's evening and putting up with us. <laughs> Last step, long process. We're with you all the way. Very proud of Arlington. Uh, let me see, do any of my colleagues wish to make a no? I'm getting no, no, no. Oh, yes. No, I'm getting a yes. Diane Mahan. I just want to take advantage of the opportunities. Two points. Um, two questions to Oak Tree, to Mugar through Oak Tree. Um, first, it was cited about um, transit-oriented project. Only one-third will have cars. That's approximately 80 cars, uh, one per minute. Um, I would question why you're bu building a 300-car parking garage underneath for 80 cars. The second I would put to you is when we went on the site visit, Ms. Noyes pointed out the what was termed the tent city with a um, alleged... Uh, criminal activity um, and cited that this project would um, get rid of that and remediate it. I would say to the Mugars through Oak Tree, that is your property. You should be responsible. You haven't done anything down there yet. I wish you would. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out. I, I really appreciate I thought I was being overly sensitive by Mr. Angler's remarks regarding Arlington and affordable housing. Um, so I kind of put that aside. I, I just want to state for the record that this Board of Selectmen um, has invested $5.75 million of community block grant development funds that we oversee and town meeting approves. That's 29% of the total funds that we get from CDBG. We're part of the North Suburban Home Consortium, which has invested $6.4 million in home funds for affordable housing in Arlington. The Housing Core um, Association, which the town works with, um, and with town support, the HCA now owns 90 units plus 67 new units projected in the next four years. Our master plan um, has received a grant from the Department of Housing to assist us with our housing production plan, which we hope to implement. Um, it was cited about the Community Preservation Act, which may assist not only with MUGAR, but also with affordable housing. Since we've hired our Director of Housing in the Planning Department, we went from 892 units on our subsidized inventory housing list to 1,121. We've adopted inclusionary zoning. Um, which has given us additional units. And we also have something very unique to, to Arlington, the Homeless Prevention Fund, with 100% um, private donations from town residents to date. Um, since I think approximately 2014, donations have totaled $597,000. That's all town money from you residents. So I, th I certainly think this Board of Selectmen, this town of Arlington, and the citizens of Arlington certainly have stated their strong support for affordable housing. Thank you. Good night, Arlington. God bless. And Belmont. Good night, everybody. We'll see you. Oh, our next meeting is Monday night, January, uh, August 17th. Move to adjourn second. Get a picture. All those in favor? Aye. Very adjourned.